good morning, colleagues. Uh, it's a privilege having all of you here. Uh, we're small and intimate, but um, specifically, we're here this morning to welcome our laureate, uh, Dr. Carney, and say good morning, Dr. Carney. It's a privilege having you here with us. I know this is long overdue um, because he's such a busy man. The last time Sir Chaba and I spoke to him, he was saying to us, he would love to come to, to Mother Fontaine, to our campus, but uh, I think your schedule only really allowed it this time around to be here. And as I'm listening to you, uh, it's not just now and then, it's constantly on the plane, and now and then you go to home and just check in on the family, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, it's special to have you here this morning. Um, we've uh, invited all the colleagues on campus to join us. Um, to spend time with you. We want to hear some and listen to some of your wisdom. And I specifically recall the discussion we had on how the arts can come into the space of managerial leadership and make a difference. So we're gonna, if you don't mind, further that discussion. But uh, before we get to formal, keeping it informal, I would love to call on Sachaba, our Chair of Council, just um, to, on behalf of Council, to officially open up this award to tell us more about that, to confirm that we have, because we always approach it as special. Sachaba, the honor, please. Cool. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, to everybody that is here, uh, thank you so much. You know, sometimes when we ask people to come and celebrate with us, they say, but we don't even see the food. Where is the food? <laughs> it's an honor indeed uh, on behalf of the Da Vinci Institute Council to welcome you here. So if you remember when the award was given, it was not possible to physically have Dr. Khan in the country. And today it's that day where we'll be able to hand over the certificate. <clears throat> I've been doing some work on the communication side. And one of the things that we are told to do is to pitch our communication at grade eight level so that everybody can read it. So if I'm not too academic in the next few minutes, just have an appreciation that I'm working in an environment where I have to talk at a grade eight level. level. So when you look at the award and why we have this particular special award uh, of the laureate at the Da Vinci Institute, we are saying, Amongst us, we have people that are impacting uh, society and societies, not just where they are, not just the continent, but at large from the world perspective. Also, not just at the time that they are living, but is the type of work and impact that will even impact future generations and humanity. And when we look at the arts and we're looking at the work that Dr. Khan has been doing over the years and how it not just touches uh, the traditional arts, but every aspect, we felt that it was worthy for us to give the Lord award to, uh, to him so that it can not just uh, be felt by the people in the arts, but it impacts us as a people in South Africa, in Africa, and globally. We had uh, uh, Dr. S uh, Professor uh, Isaac Bono coming here physically. They were giving their award together, and we were also able to speak to it. Uh, we thank you for the message that you did send through during our, our, um, our graduation ceremonies there, and the message went in through. But people are feeling touchy. We want to be here, especially now there's a big movie that's coming up, the sequel, those type of things. Not many people have this kind of access. Um, I was excusing myself from one meeting and they said, no, it can't be true. He's probably in Hollywood, somewhere far. And I said, that's the thing, isn't it? When you have a global icon that impacts globally, even when he's here, it's only fair that the Da Vinci Institute just amplifies that association. So we are really honored to have you. And as uh, Professor Klopper said, just to expand some of the, uh, the conversations and the engagement as to how you see yourself impacting or not impacting uh, humanity and society through the work that you have done, the work that you do, and the work that you'll be doing. I'll just end where Sadhguru says, the past has happened. You can't do anything about it. The future hasn't happened. You can't do anything about it. The present is here. 
be present and impact what you can now because that's all you have. Thank you so much for being here and uh, welcome. Um, so before we call on Dr. Kani, we must first do the awards, Sitaba. Yep. So if I can ask you. Should we move that side or yeah. the side? And as, as I'm presenting it, I took a picture with uh, Dr. Kane once, and I said, in this picture, who is important? He says, always follow the money, and to make sure that you never crop, get cropped out of the picture. Across <laughs> the shoulders with everybody that you bring, <laughs> is important. So, I'm going to make sure. <laughs> so, you will be cropped out in your I crop myself. <laughs> These two gentlemen called me and told me about the Da Vinci Institute and gave me a very brief but condensed history and achievements of this institute by preparing leaders of the future, addressing the most lacking area, especially in Africa, the technological science business side. We went to, I've been uh, so many graduations, all University of South Africa getting our PhDs and did it. The queue of 250 students come to collect their BA degree. BA. Next one, BA. Next one, BA. And some of them are in theology. Some of them are in African languages. Some of them are in anthropology. Some of them are in, in various sectors and even about within the arts constituency. And I'm just thinking, sitting there, maybe there's a place somewhere there in the market that's looking for someone to be a CEO who just graduated in anthropology. Maybe there's some company there that's looking for some young man who has a distinction in theology. He doesn't want to be a priest. He doesn't want to be a pastor. He's stupid. He could make a lot of money if he could be an evangelist with an ATM in the tent. But he still does this. So then there was this identified gap where we prepare holistically the younger and the future generation. And this is where, in understanding these two gentlemen about what Da Vinci does, this institution, it bridges that gap. It gives the future leader a broader perspective of something called business. When in Accra they talk about STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and maths. And that's all they want to study at school. They don't want to hear about what Shakespeare did in 1613. They don't want to study about what Iskum Patlele did. They don't want to read about anything. They don't even know what literature is. But all they want to be, they want to learn the science, the technology, the IT. And I ask a friend of mine who's now the, the, uh, the vice chancellor of this university. I said, you guys, you keep talking IT. Explain this thing. What do you mean by IT? He says, no, it's artificial intelligence. I said, I know that, but explain it to me. He said, okay, now eight times eight, you could put eight to eight, eight is 16 and keep going until you get eight times, which will be 64. Or you can take a simple computer and say eight times eight and equal 64. That's the intelligence taken away from you. You get to the point quicker. Now, when I was at high school, I was a maths and science student. Oh, I saw myself in my father's dream that I have to be a doctor. And I prepared everything and I was studying math and uh, science. You know, it's high school. There was still the form one, form two. Some of you guys were not born when we use form one and form two. Incidentally, I'm 79 years old. So when I finished, then I suddenly got caught by something else. My grandfather had three wives and could not spell polygamy. <laughs> he just said, three wives, there's no problem in that. <laughs> you have a problem, you have a problem. <laughs> Grandma Wan was an incredible woman. 
an incredible woman who taught us the clan, the history of the Kani clan, Abatim. She made me believe actually that I'm Prince Kani. I come from a royal line, that my great great grandfather was supposed to be the king of the Abatimbu, but he went hunting. And during his absence, somebody was placed in the screen after the, in the seat after the, the, uh, the king died. So he hoped that when he came back, he would be given his kingdom, but he never was. So Singondobe, meaning we will one day return the kingdom to you. I think, I think she wasn't telling me the truth. <laughs> but what I knew, she was preparing me as a young man to be faced with an onslaught of a party system that was dehumanizing, that defined me as a non-human being. She knew I needed that confidence that when I look in the mirror and I see the image of God, that is me. And I developed this confidence bordering arrogance, which was a very good feeling to be arrogant, especially based on what you know and broader information and knowledge. Grandma too brought school and education in my family. My grandfather felt the school, the kids are not working in the fields, they're not doing this because they're busy sitting on the desk learning nonsense. So she brought school and religion. My father, grandfather had a problem with his Jewish family that seems to be senior than him in his own world. That is Jesus and Abraham and all those people. And that was my grandfather. Now grandmother three was a, a beautician. My grandfather was always in the smaller house. <laughs> in Lengunan. And she taught me the respect for humanity. She taught me, there was a little girl who walked past and says, do you know that little girl? I said, yeah, no zipper. Do you know her? I said, yes, I know her. When you see that girl, what do you see? I said, oh, no zipper. He said, no, look again. I said, my makul. I know her. <laughs> she said, when you see her, you see me. What you're going to say to that girl must be something you can say to me too. What you're going to do to that young girl must be something you can do to me or you, that would make me feel proud. Wow. That was my first lesson in learning about respect for gender because I suddenly realized that basically all my life, this famous John Gunny all over the world, I sometimes even forget that my mother was a woman. And that's where I come from. So I then went to university at Forte. Oh, then there was a strike, then we went back home. And by the time we went back home, I met this group of people who were working in drama, creating and writing plays. And I and among them was this white guy, you know, with a little beard and a pipe. And that time in the 60s, we did not mince our words. We was the good guys, and I'm sorry, HB, you was the bad guys. <laughs> That was the only way we can build a resistance by accepting who we are and be proud of who we are and know that this land belongs to us. And unless you accept the naturalization by order of life that whatever ethnic group you are, if you are on this continent, you are African. That was how I got into writing. The idea was looking at the, 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 the young township boy, the young township girl, and try and say, how can I mold, how can I give this young person a little more meaning in their lives, a little bit sense in their lives? I, I know everybody wanted to be a doctor and engineer. Everybody wanted to do all the kind of snazzy things that, and I even wanted to do law, but my father said, no, you'll be arrested the first time <laughs> you go. And then I then grew up. My daughter went to school. She came back, grade zero. There was no R in my time. And she had this drawing of two circles and another circle and two sticks. And another one and another one. Mom had a smile, comma like that. I had scratches around here that says, that's you. 
my God. And I thought, we got a Picasso in this house. Slowly, she kept bringing these paintings. We put them on the fridge, you see, we're so proud of it. Then the other day, she brought a house with a little circle, which was the sun, and there were trees in front. The windows were just crosses. The door was just one line down. And I knew that there's an artist growing here. There's someone wanting to interpret their own environment through their own eyes. There's someone who's dealing with the, how the outer self impacts on the inner self, which is me. How do I react to what's happening around me? How the environment that I grow up in shapes me and makes me something that I could not have been if I had a better environment or makes me something much better if I had a conducive and promoting and a creative environment. She went to standard or grade one. We had to go buy some bag and we put a lot of books. Grade one. She came home with a shoulder lying down and all she did in the entire life from grade one to grade 12 was homework. The artist was gone. That visionary was gone. All I have in that house, I have seven children, meaning I have wrote grade 12 seven times with them. But I realized without that component, that humanity that sees beyond the technology, the science, the maths, the engineering, the, the IT, and beyond all that, there's a human being that has to relate to another human being. It is that human being, if it's not taken care of carefully, will be involved in workaholic, serial worker, and then even serial boyfriend and serial girlfriend. It would mean that there is no appreciation of beauty there's no appreciation of, of, of the things that matter, the soul. Tabon Begi likes to quote, quote this one. It says, uh, what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? That soul is my responsibility. I feed that soul. You go on in, t in taking on the entire world but I'll make sure that your soul, parallel, is being developed with the knowledge you're accumulating. Rural Kosa, oh, let me tell you first, the translation in my language is it Kosa. Uh, what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Guess it Kosa, prof. And you want me to speak English? <laughs> Did you understand what I've just said? That's the beauty of language. That is the beauty. When I was in Leeds with my play, Nothing But The Truth, I was asked to speak to architects. And I'm thinking, excuse me, I'm a playwright. I'm an actor, what am I gonna do with these architects? They had seen the set I had designed, which was abstract in for the play, which represented a four-room house with the roof lifting like that, which means that whatever was happening inside that house was exploding the foundation of this society that's found in this house. And that is the concept and the interpretation that I was discussing with architects. When I was in, the, in England, we speak again about science because acting is a science. There's methodology. There's a way of doing it right and a way of doing it wrong. Writing is a science. It's not just simply that we write stories to entertain you. We're trying to come into this being and make this being question some of the foundations of their thought processes. When I went to Stellenbosch, I was telling Prof that the unfortunate incident of a young man who urinated on another young man's property, and there's a second case again. There's another you three who urinated it. The question is, where does a kid that was born beyond the year 2000 get this thinking? 
How do you say? They're not even born freeze. They're the 2000s, you know. They don't know nothing about apartheid. They can't complain and even pretend that there was apartheid and racism. They're born in the new order. So how then do we, and he was doing some masters in some uh, economics, this young kid. And I'm sitting that in front and I'm asking, where does it happen? It actually happens where the first lesson of life, where education begins at home with mom and dad. We make these statements without being aware how close the children's ears are. You see Jacob Zuma and you say corruption, corruption, liar, this. I see the white person and says, damn you, we should have killed them all. The following day, your daughter and my daughter are in grade one together. What do you think the conversation is going to be between these two kids? They're going to echo you and me. So in my studies, I want to intervene first with a parent by saying, come and see a play. It's such a wonderful excuse of getting you people inside. <laughs> switch the lights off and make you think magic is going to happen. And yet when the lights come back and then I tell you what exactly is wrong with you. How you make a contribution to the development of this country, our people. We talk about with Professor uh, uh, Tulima Donzella as we are part of the champions of social justice. And there we break down the meaning of freedom in the perception of the grassroots. I asked Nelson Mandela once, I said, Dada, you, you, you asked us to fight for freedom, to fight for this in the struggle, to fight for liberation. You've mentioned so many things. Now you go talk to these white people and you come back with a new word we've never heard of, democracy. Never, ever in Tanzania, in Lusaka, in, in Egypt, wherever we are, we've never mentioned that word democracy. I don't know what it means. He said, I'm not going to tell you, John, because you want to write a play about it. <laughs> so I still now don't know the difference. So the arts are part of building this leader that we're looking at for the future. I love when you say the past is out there, Prof. And there's very little we can do about it, just for reference, if we want to go to the library and hear what's happened over time. The future is so distant, can't, I can't even believe that tomorrow is the future. Tomorrow is just another day, the future is still out there and a little far away. I like that. It is the present that is our task. So how do I come to business people? How do I come to people who are prepared, being prepared to run the ESCOM? Ruel Koza said, a CEO that has no sense of humanity, that doesn't understand the responsibility, the human cost of balancing the books and reducing overheads so that there could be profitability and that there would be dividends for shareholders. Do you know what the overheads are? Are the workers. You reduce the working staff when you're not balancing the books. You are accountant and you are you woman auditors. And that balance that you reduce by removing us, because we are the human easy cost. Each one of us here stands for four to five to six to eight people. You have retrenched eight people. But you don't think that way because you don't see the human element or content of what you're doing. You're just a CEO that's going to get its bonuses when actually the company is going down, you get a bonus for having saved it from complete collapse. Yet, in solving and saving the company, you have damaged the fabric of a society. You have messed up with what's called the family structure. That's where we come into you, CEO, and say, see beyond your figures, the bottom line. Do not make me social responsibility. I am a component that is critical in the success of this company. 
And that's where for me that the arts will always, I love, I love this science and technology people when they sit down and they have drawings in the boards with triangles and all and they use art directions and circles and says this is this, this is that. That's art, isn't it? They talk about PowerPoint presentation, they stole it from me. <laughs> but they're not crediting me. They stole it from, they're not crediting me. So art and science, art and business, arts generally is interwoven in everything we do. For as long as we are human beings that are responsible for other human beings, stop making babies if you do not want to be a human being. Be this android that is the best CEO, the best engineering, the best scientist. For which we were punished, of course, when we found that all those variants of COVID-19. I was in England on my way home, and we were told South Africa, the planes won't land there because South Africa has just discovered another variant of the COVID-19. So, James Stewart does a beautiful thing and follows where this variant comes from, <laughs> not from Africa. <laughs> it was all over the world except in Africa. And such the South African scientists decided we will not disclose anymore whatever we find out because it impacted not just on tourism, not just on business, but on the lives of the people we care so much about. If you love your wife, you love your fellow human being, you cannot only be an economist, only be an engineer, only be a science master, only be a, a, an analytic, analytic person who does overhaul certain companies because you know how to restructure and by removing human beings. My job is always to remind you to see me behind each figure. That's the arts. I went to Paris and I went to see uh, at the, the Michelangelo painting the ceiling lying on his back. And I'm thinking, my God, the kind of mathematical mind, geometry, and figures and structures this wonderful human must have been. He's an artist, incidentally. I do remember Michelangelo. I don't know who was the Duke at that time. I don't care, but I remember Michelangelo. So we will outlive you anytime. <laughs> I went to KwaZulu Natal and I was given a present which was a, a, a portrait of Nelson Mandela. I was given by Mkize before the digital scandal. So don't link me to it. <laughs> oh, there's another one. Digital, you see, you people, you get us in trouble. This huge portrait is done in beads. It's this big. So the two women who did it to present it to me, <laughs> they can't speak English. They have the other young girl who's explaining to Baba Wuti, this is a gift. Because of your work. And your contribution to our youth. Now I'm trying to ask, you don't go to school. How could you make an octagon? When do you know that this octagon has got equal angles around it? Because you're not educated, you don't know mathematics, you didn't do geometry, you didn't even do trigonometry, you don't know nothing. So I ask her, when you put your beads, when do you know that you're going to do a 45 degrees angle? He says, you look at it and then your last bead will tell you that I need to get another bead to move this way now. <laughs> I'm looking for a geometrical understanding. She says, no, when you put the last bit, you will see that now I need to go this way now. It's amazing. And that's what we call indigenous knowledge. That, that, that intelligence that we seem to look down at because we are auditors, KPMG, that didn't see that the Guptas were swindling everybody. <laughs> You see how our art is there? Uh, do you see how broad we must be to be writers? We know and we need to know everything. We need to know everything. I've just done a movie now. Uh, it's called Beyond the Light Barrier. I didn't know that in Moy River, 
Just at the beginning of the Drakensberg range, there is a flat hill there. It's called the, the Hill of Lights. It is purported by history that a flying saucer landed there. And a woman called Elizabeth Clara went to check. And she was taken and abducted by these aliens. And she came back uh, after years in her mind. Actually, she even had a child in the planet of, of, of Menton and had this wonderful love affair with this being. Now, the scientists were saying, it's impossible, because she was just unconscious for five minutes. She couldn't have been abducted and gone. But somebody used the light years definitions and said, in the year calculation of the planet where she went, this is, could easily be 30 years. So when she came back, she came back to the time she left. But it does not take away the fact that she was in that time and she had a child. And this woman was called the first lady of the space. NASA came down to Moy River to talk to her and asked her to describe, she's a librarian, the spaceship inside. They were amazed at how Elizabeth Clara was so accurate about the internal space inside. They asked her, what do you think your boyfriend explained to you that powers the flying saucer? She went into nuclear physics. This is a lady who's a librarian. She went into nuclear physics. She was invited all over the world to explain how this thing is operated. But she came back with a message that her boyfriend said, South Africa or Africa or the world must stop depending on fuel, fossil fuel. You're destroying your only planet. We've learned this. We are now on the third planet because we went your way. She talked about climate change. She talked about ozone layers. She talked about carbon footprint. She talked about these things. And this is a librarian. When I read those books, and in a movie, of course, CGI, you should know that, computer-generated images. I travel with her as, a, as, as, as an observer. So I've been through all those different galaxies, you see. And that's the beauty of being an actor. <laughs> you can travel and be all these people you've always wanted to be and not necessarily just be at home. But what I'm trying to say is that art cannot be separated from Anything that we learn, we practice, and we do, we execute, even within the judiciary. I love I see bad actors, bad actors trying to defend somebody who's actually not guilty and would be found guilty because this advocate is such a bad actor. <laughs> I wish I could just say, please present your case this way. And this is somehow for me, the role of the arts, much beyond movies and Hollywood, much beyond plays and writings and awards and all that, it is part of the components you need when you are educating a being holistically. We're the only people or species that live on this earth that can listen to music and appreciate dogs. It has been found, it's a fallacy that baboons and chimpanzees are listening to Tchaikovsky. Some scientists, it's nonsense. They don't care about the sound we are making. It's us who appreciates beauty. It's us who appreciates music. It's us who appreciates art. When we do that, there's a something within ourselves that is fulfilled a little more, a little more than my major and my certificate. You've got to come out of this wonderful Da Vinci institutions with all your accreditations and, 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 and degrees and all and come into the real world. I was talking to students in Stellenbosch and they were saying, Dr. Kani, who cannot know summer? We finish studying here and get, I'm, I'm doing arts, I'm doing fine arts, I'm doing music, I'm doing classical music. And I say, how can we get into the industry? I said, you gotta wait for me to die. <laughs> Nobody's putting money on you. The money's on John Kani, not you. But determination, 
motivation, passion. I'm giving, I'm giving up spirit. You're going to give way because he's knocking this little thing. He's knocking all the time. And then they're going to come in. You're going to graduate here and you're going to go what? To, to what company that's looking for someone who knows about economy and science and what? There are people already working there. And what happens in big business out there, we say we need someone with these kinds of qualifications. Do you know? I know my, my son's aunt. So by the time the position is advertised, it's already filled. We're doing it to comply with the labor law that this was advertised. The Artscape wants to do my play, which I've just written with Sir Anthony Shea, uh, which is uh, starring Anthony with me. It's called uh, Kunene and the King. I'll tell you later what it is about. But then they want the play to the Artscape. So they send me a tender form as the writer so that I should fill in this tender form so that my play could be presented at the Artscape in Cape Town. It asks how many people presented for this play, for this project. <laughs> you think, okay, Bridget, can we just rewind? <laughs> you called me. You want to put my plays written by me. You are giving me a form that says how many people presented tenders for this project. Me only. He said, Dada, please just ignore the other circles. <laughs> Just don't tick there. Do you see the structure you've created? You business people, you people who run the big companies and corporations, you have created a structure that's not palatable with human development. So you've got to be conscious when you do these things that there is the other side which is me and life. I want every student, every lecturer here to be familiar with the beauty of the arts to go and see Cinderella. As the special brand said to me in 1982, why don't you write a play like nothing? Why do you always crap, crap on the government? I said, sir, I would do Cinderella, but Cinderella would be white and the prince would be black. So there you go again. <laughs> this is what the arts are about. It, it retains your own humanity. It retains that feeling that when you sit there and your daughter does the worst singing and you say, oh my dear, this is beautiful, beautiful. And you truly believe it's beautiful. We used to do the beauty pageant for my mother. My mom, we were seven men and four daughters. So we'll all parade for the beauty. And mom would decide who wins this time. Who is Miss My Home. And she truly believed that we was beautiful. It is that that's carried me throughout my life. My uncle was a scientist. He worked at a gas company in the Eastern Cape. He was in, 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 in chemistry. And I took him to see a play of mine, Master Harold and the Boys, just before he died. And he said, this is a very good story. It teaches us about who we are says a chemist. So, while we are here, yes, we need you. Please do not make my mistake. We need you. We're now talking about cadre deployment. We said it's got to stop because we need people qualified with an experience to do the job. A friend of mine is, is, I mean, is, is appointed by, in a cabinet reshuffle by Tabon Begi as the Deputy Minister of Arts and Culture. I said, well, I grew up with her. I know she could improvise. I mean, there's nothing so much they're going to do for the arts. She will only speak when the, when the minister has gone somewhere. She will speak at artists' funerals so she can manage that. <laughs> there's another reshuffling. She's now Deputy Minister of Forestry and Water to Denga. <laughs> And I'm thinking, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. We both grew up in the township. We don't know what a forest look like. <clears throat> hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. We don't know what a forest look like. How do we know about water purification, recycling? We don't know nothing about that. That was not it. 
Jacob Zuma becomes president, she is minister of energy. That's nuclear physics. She must be an extremely intelligent person. Do you understand what we talk about cadre deployment? Is placing party people who will be part of maintaining the present leadership as rotten or as good as it is. Now, you are the only one that can break that cycle. As we move on now, even to outlaw cadre deployment, we want to take it to the Supreme Court, we want to take it to the, to the Constitutional Court, that no president can suddenly decide, well, let me see, you will be the Minister of um, Economics. <laughs> We've got to say, no, 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 we need to know more about you. Motlante now is saying anybody who nominates himself to run for any position within the ANC, we need to do a lifestyle audit. We need to do a, a, a what is it workers fear most? Uh, what is it when you check the capacity of people? What are the qualifications? Yes. Because once you start that, you know that they want to fire me. They want to fire me. And you go to the union and the union just makes a big thing about it and nobody's fired. We've got to get to that point where we have a pool of qualified, eager, young people who are ready to take on this country to another level. And they will only come from the Da Vinci and similar schools. They're not going to come from out there. They're with you. But what fascinates me about you people, for years, in the 70s and the 60s, there was only one opposition in parliament, Helen Sussman of the United Party and then the Progressive Party. Yet, Wits University, Gramstown University, Cape Town University, Rose University were annually depositing into the community graduates from the most liberal universities, which you thought would grow the opposition to apartheid by white people. It did not. Because as soon as they graduated, they went to uncle's farm, uncle's business, uncle's own, my other businesses. So they did not carry the liberalism which they were supposed to have been given in a critical thinking environment, which is an education institution. It allows us to think critically, to question everything. It does not mean that as my, my uncle said to my nephew, so one plus one is two, she said, no, 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 it's three digits. There's one is a digit, there's a plus sign is a digit, there's another one is a digit. So my uncle says, so you mean it makes three? He said, yes, you can see that way. He says, well, mom has got chicken tonight, you're gonna have the third leg. <laughs> That's the thing I'm talking about. We need to partner. We need to find ways of saying we can do this together. We need to say there's a role for academic achievements, but there is also a role that looks after the soul. There's a role for writers, there's a role for musicians, there's a role for paintings, there's a role for artists, there's a role for wonderful things that happen in this country that define who we are as a people. It's not my certificate, it's not my graduates, it's my culture, it's my language, it's my behavior, it's my passion for humanity, it's my caring for the other person, it's seeing the other person. Please see, don't walk, see, stop and see. It's not sympathy, no empathy, it's just seeing a brother or a sister's pain. It's in the Bible. I am my brother's keeper, I am my sister's keeper. People talk about gender-based violence. It's such a nonsense abbreviation. I don't know what you mean. Are you afraid to say it's a criminal courts? It's crime to assault a woman just because you could lift a wheelbarrow and she can't? Is that your reason for your strength? How does that impact on your brain that you think a woman, because you're stronger, you can tell her what to do? People say that we have men's organizations that will say, don't do it in my time. We are here to make sure that we protect women. We are here that we make sure the women in our townships are looked after. Women don't need you, sir. They've never needed you, ever. I need you. If I fix you, she has no problem. 
If I make you who I am, who I believe is a responsible young man who knows and feels and has a responsibility in building a nation that is non-genderless, then I don't need to protect her because you're a good person. So it's not about us protecting women. It's not about women protecting themselves. It's me and you that's the problem. We are the major problem. And we are addressing that, sir, through the arts. We speak through the arts. We create these images. We create these images. So, so, somebody was watching a, a play by guys in Shawelo. And uh, oh, it's a bad play. <laughs> but they're young people. They are all sort of the selling goods on Jeppe Street. You know, the, the Hong Kong Nikes and on that and that material and that. And there's another one sitting on the side. He's Kichengwe. He's a witch doctor from uh, Nairobi. And he's selling this medicine that could, uh, of course, you know, as men, help him. <laughs> right. And of course, ladies, you could have a baby by tomorrow. <laughs> And he's got all this medication. And then the Lindella truck stops and they're all arrested. And they're taken to the deportation center. So he says, can I have a word with you, sir? He says, yes, I'm actually not African. I'm South African. Because these people who were arrested, they're all from Africa. They're Africans. And he says in very private, actually say, I'm not African. I'm South African. I'm not even Chikwengwe. I'm from Dobsonville. <laughs> it's the only way I could sell these things. You see, you're missing the deep psychological damage that is done by this country by isolating us from the rest of the continent that sees us to the pigmentation of our skin. If your lips are smaller and flat and my buttocks are bigger, I am a different race and a different person. So then they think that to be arrested here is for African that comes from another country. He is not African. It's the same thing we get when we go to America. African-Americans only come to Africa because there's, you go to be a Hyatt or a Hilton, there must be a McDonald's or a Burger King, and they must be taken to see Kruger National Park, and they must be at the airport the following day out, and they've been to Africa. We just did a play in New York called Origins which is a young man who comes from northern uh, West Africa, comes to New York. He is more welcomed by white Americans who understand that the background where he comes from, that he's not just a political refugee, he's running away from his own life. But the African Americans are saying, yeah, these Africans are all over the place. Damn you, man, go back to Africa. But then when they come here, they kiss the ground. I don't kiss the ground nowhere because it's dirty. So. All I'm saying to you, we need you. We need these qualifications. We need these new young brains. Please be aware, ma'am, that you are in the process of molding our leaders of tomorrow. You, you, you might just think I teach them, I go home, I get fed up with HB, I put Professor Chab, I get fed up with everybody, but never overlook the responsibility you have. My metric teacher, Urendel Petene, when I got my first doctorate, which I wrote for Rhodes University, he comes over to me and he says, John Carney, what a pleasant surprise. You turned out well. <laughs> I, I knew that was the words he's trying to find in his mouth to say congratulations. I knew that. Because I knew Randall Patton had the difficulty with us because we were the naughtiest brats at school. We didn't even know why we went to school, but we went there because we were not working at home. There was no idea and there was no education anyway. Because what in 1955 Hendrik Fervood did, did, he took out the, 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 the kind of mathematical engineering content out of our education and left us with English only. On Wednesday, we boys would go to agriculture and plant little nonsenses and spinach with red lines like veins of a dying woman. And then the girls would go straight to domestic. 
science and there they were taught to be maids for white houses in the future we're doing great jc we're going to metric and we're doing this we're being prepared to play the service role it's a miracle out of that type of education that you could find some of us survived it that you and the present generation has no excuse you have no excuse you have to be useful you have to know your responsibility. You have to intervene. You have to move now. These leaders of tomorrow are not going to come through osmosis or some strange evolution. You will make them. You will physically intervene and cooperate with them to prepare them for the future. So you might just think in that now we're doing some business courses, science, technology, IT, uh, to what artificial, all intelligence. No, that's not what you're doing here. You're supplying a need that will take this country forward. At the moment, we have a situation which is very dire. Very, very dire. People in all over the continent says, we're so let down by South Africa. You were our only hope. You didn't opt to civil war. You didn't opt to um, trials and, and tribunals and uh, Hague sort of uh, punishing white people from the crimes of the past. You opted to use whatever brain you have to take this country forward. It ended with the end of mid Tabombegi, when suddenly the old habits came into place. And now we are in the middle of that old habit. You need to break this cycle. You need to be prepared to go out there and say, we need a conversation, sir. There's no reason why Da Vinci Institute cannot call Cyril Ramaphos and say, can we just sit down? We just want a conversation. We want to introduce you to what we do. And say, look, this is what we do. So next time in the coming governments of the up couple of years, these people here would be ready for these positions. Can you just make sure that there's a space for them? We went to see the president and said, the arts played a critical role in mobilizing the thinking of international leaders. We spoke at United Nations, man, from New Brighton Township to explain the impact and the inhumanity of this system. And today we are like, yeah, of course, yeah, minister will come when someone dies. So our minister of arts and culture is called the minister of condolences. <laughs> so, as I sit down, we got to make a secret pact. We got to have a partnership here. We has to have. We must behave like union negotiators who, when they don't understand what's happening in discussions with management, they say, "Cock us." <laughs> and they step outside and they say, stop talking. You are just on their side. Let's take this position. I know we won't get 15%. We're not stupid. But we're not accepting three. So don't make it 20 now when. Come down a little. And then the meeting starts again. It's just that we don't do that. We don't stop and caucus. I sat for eight years in the WITS governing council. I said there, I'm now 79. I was about 71 or 72 then. And it's strange that I was the youngest in the room. <laughs> All the guys are so old. I said, I think we should look at Remco and Finco. I said, what the hell is this? I'm paging those pages. Remuneration committee, Finco, finance committee, those little things. They're so into the slogans of DBVC, Deputy Vice Chancellor. Now the DBVC. And as soon as we do the finances, everybody says, I did say, Chair, I wouldn't be able to stay long. We haven't discussed the issues confronting the institution. And I listened to the Finco guy, Rendell, who is now, you know him very well, he's always in the news. I looked at the budget. And there was a little slice, like a slice of an orange, that says student fees. This is what they expect, 6%. 
no, 3.5% from the students to balance the budget. I said, why would you do that? It's stupid. The kids are not going to pay school fees. So remove that and let the budget be short by 3.5%. Go back to the Minister of Higher Education and say, increase the budget because we cannot depend on students paying the fees. Lord Almighty, the following day, it was um, fees must fall. I said, you see, I told you. I'm like a witch doctor. <laughs> I told you. So we need to do what is important. While we educate these young people, while we give them the skills to manage and to be part of this great future of South Africa, but please do bring them to the theater. Let them just sit down and watch a play and learn just a little bit about themselves and understand that the LGBTV++ it's not a manufactured concept, it's who we are. Somebody said to me, nee, Brad John, you know that being gay is not something that, that, that is African. I said, well, tell me something. When someone has, is gay in the African community, what's the African word for it? It's Daban. I said, if it's in our language, it's older than us. <laughs> you see, the attitudes, we break those attitudes within the arts. We make them understand the role of the arts. Not just entertainment, entertainment is an excuse. I could do that, make a movie in Hollywood and make $15 million. I don't have to do that. Because what is Black Panther about? I don't know. It's a place called Wakanda. When the director said, Northeast of Nigeria, I said, sir, be careful. Northeast Nigeria is Boko Haram neighborhood. Oh, no, no, therefore it's somewhere then in Africa. So that is our role, together with your role, to get these young people ready for the future of South Africa. I'll give them the soul, the humanity. I'll give them the sense of feeling, of seeing, of identifying, of being moved. I'll make them better boyfriends. I'll make them better husbands. I'll make them better human beings. I'll make them see the pain of another human being and be moved to do something about it. You give them the skills. Because without the money and those skills, they are unable to impact in the changes they want to make. The world listen to me now because I'm a very rich black actor and a famous one. Incidentally, just before I sit down, I have an invitation at home from King Charles and Queen's a consort to attend a gala on the 22nd of November, which they are hosting the President of the Republic of South Africa. But I'm thinking, okay, it's johnbkani at gmail.com. It doesn't say in brackets South Africa. <laughs> So how the hell does it for the secretary of foreign, foreign secretary think I'm going to get to England? So I'm saying to my wife, how did my name get on that guy? I don't know. He's English. He said, well, I don't know. That's who we are. We have the ear of the media. Sometimes the wrong ear of the media. We look at ourselves so painfully, painfully careful. We do not want to be involved or be smeared by anything because then you lose the incredible power you have in the bringing up of the next generation. I said to my father, I want to be an actor. He said, get in the car. We went to a Sangoma, what's the care? He says he's got a bloody degree. He's working at Ford Motor Company. He's in the personal department. He wants to do something I don't know. And the old lady threw the bones and he said he's going to go mad. He's going to, Mafufunyana, the Tikoloshes are going to speak in his ears. And my father said, yes, yes, I saw him yesterday talk alone. <laughs> I was learning my lines in a Greek tragedy. I was learning my lines. It took him 20 years, 10 years, finally to accept and introduce me to his friends and said, hey guys, this is my son, John Cunning. He's an actor. Oh, can you lend a I mean, this thing is doing is working. You see? But then there's a young man, your son says, I want to be a singer. 
please remember, just like John can. It doesn't mean like the ones you know that are rubbish in the streets. It means me. I want to be an artist. Don't say no because you think I've seen artists struggle. No, no. He's using me as an example. You say to him, if you're going to be like Uta Tukani, yes. Tell me more. Because then he will then come back and be part of this society. Business is important, critical. GDP and all those things you mentioned, it's fantastic, I know about them, but they don't make a holistic human being. They create an android that knows nothing but figures and work and figures and work. I need someone who says to his wife, can we go for a concert this evening? You think going to the restaurant is not art, it's culinary art, dummy. <laughs> They make an omelet and they place it and they place it and they have a presentation into your plate and you think this looks beautiful. I don't care how it tastes like. That's art. On Heritage Day, you put your swasti and your Zulu things and you put your things and skins here because it's Heritage Day. I feel sorry for white people because they can't wear the, the bure kapi, <laughs> kapi commando because they don't know what to wear. It's just not that. It's not about that. Heritage Day is about bringing these different cultures together. It's sharing our differences that actually makes us much stronger. That's what Heritage Day is about. The 16th of June is not a day for politicians to talk about the coming elections in 2024. It's for young people. It's a youth day. They should make speeches all over the Republic and tell us how we fail them. And those that are successful and tell the others how I got assistance there and there. Women's Day is not the 9th of August. It's from the 1st of January to the 31st of December. It's Women's Day. Don't beat up your wife after 16 days of, of abstaining in December. And you say, yeah, pay 16, Zakfuman. <laughs> say, I want to thank you for inviting me. And thank you, HB, for this incredible honor. The people that I know, know about this institution. I sent you, I just posted it uh, because you were holding something. I said, I received this from Da Vinci, the Laureate Award. And in three days, I had 562 likes, 1,000 likes. I sent you that, 562,000 likes, because they knew about the institution. And they were proud that this institution recognized this old man. So they know what you do. We do know what you do. Deliver. Thank you very much, Dr. Kani. That was very inspiring. I think the wisdom, the insights, the lesson, looking in the mirror, and all of that, you know, will take us forward, you know, reflecting back on life. And we really appreciate it coming from the heart. Thank you very much.